Good morning, everybody, and welcome to session two of the Source Water Protection webinar series. So today we're focusing on transcending jurisdiction through partnerships. I want to start off by respectfully acknowledging that I'm hosting this webinar from Kelowna, which is in the traditional and unceded territory of this Okanagan Silk people. And we have people joining from all across BC, uh, from Ontario, from Quebec and beyond. So I encourage you to take a moment right now and think about and acknowledge the traditional territories you are joining from. And on that note as well, I really believe that local governments and water suppliers, which is a target audience for this webinar, can, can play an important role in building positive relationships with Indigenous communities. And source protection planning is really strengthened when you can include Indigenous values, knowledge, and leadership from the beginning. Is it easy? No. Is it essential? Absolutely. I, I think so. So today you'll get a quick intro from me, and then we are joined by eight panelists from two different technical advisory committees. So I think it's going to be a very interesting um, presentation and discussion, and we'll have some Q&A at the end of the webinar. So a couple of housekeeping items. If you weren't with us last week, um, feel free to go back and watch the recording from that first webinar. All recordings will be posted on the Source Water Protection Toolkit website. And I forgot to mention last week as well that these webinars have been approved by PIBC for one CPL unit. And also we're just in the process right now of getting approval for um, Environmental Operators certifi Certification Program CEUs. So just keep that in mind if you're a part of any of those organizations. Uh, start off by a huge thank you. If you were here last week, you saw this slide, but this, the toolkit project and these webinars um, have had so many people involved. We have this really extensive stellar technical advisory committee that helped write the toolkit and um, a consulting team from Lorette Aquatic Consulting. We've had funding from many, many different funding partners and the latest being the Healthy Watersheds Initiative funding partner. And then thanks to Casey Moran, who's helped me coordinate these webinars. Just a sneak peek into the upcoming webinars, in case you weren't here last week. So we've got um, seven more after this and they're featuring a wide variety of speakers. Um, next week is Indigenous led projects. And then the following week, we've got a whole bunch of folks from Ontario, uh, the government, Conservation Ontario and Conservation Authorities. And then from there, we've just got this whole slew of topics and speakers uh, joining us. So last week, we really dove into the toolkit. So today, I'm just going to uh, remind you, this is what it looks like. Um, if you are new, this is your first session, feel free to go to sourcewaterprotectiontoolkit.ca and download the PDF. Um, it's got three parts. So the first one is, is meant to clarify and simplify the source water protection planning process. The second part is the action part of the toolkit. So eight tools to improve source water protection in your communities. And then part three is this massive amount of additional information and resources. So more information on the regulatory framework, economic benefits, common threats, and how to overcome them, come them, and then pages of, temp of useful links and then templates. And again, this is all on um, the toolkit as a PDF, but it's also been put onto a web-based platform. So why are we here today? Well, <laughs> Water governance in BC is extremely complicated and complex, and there isn't a lead provincial agency kind of guiding the process. So you've got municipal, provincial, and federal legislation that um, governs water. And then of course, you've got unceded rights and title um, within the, the watersheds. And the challenge is that local water suppliers are mandated to provide safe, potable water for their customers, but they often don't have um, regulatory jurisdiction in the source watersheds. So partnerships are essential, and that's what we're here to talk about today. They provide many be benefits, including, you know, identifying new opportunities, increasing efficiencies, um, mutual benefits of conservation planning, regulation and planning and development. So you've got all within a department, uh, like an organization, a local government organization, you've got many different departments, engineering, planning, parks. And when they work together, you um, have a lot of uh, benefits towards source water protection. 
So today we're here to talk about partnerships and we are extremely lucky, I think, to be joined by panelists from two different technical advisory committees. So the, the first panelist group will be led by Julie Pisani and they're from the regional district of Nanaimo. And so we've got um, four of the technical advisory committee members. So Julie Pisani will be doing a presentation and she's joined by Jessica, Jessica Doyle with FLNRORD, Mike Squire, who's with the city of Nanaimo, and Pam Jor Jorgensen, who's a professional forester with Mosaic Forest Management. So that's the first group. And then the second group is led by Tricia Brett and the Regional District of North Okanagan Tag. So she's the water quality manager with RDNO. She's joined by Ian McClellan, Rob Dinwoody, and Jamie Skitter. And Jamie's with TOCO, Rob and Ian are with FLNRORD which is forest lands, natural resource operations and rural development for those of you who aren't from BC. It's a mouthful. So I'd like to invite Julie to bring up her presentation now. Fantastic, thanks for the introduction, Kelly. So I'll just take a moment to share my screen and get started. All right, Kelly, is that coming through? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So yeah, once again, thanks very much for including us uh, within the webinar series. Uh, today I'll be leading a panel discussion uh, with some members of our technical advisory committee uh, from the regional district of Nanaimo's drinking water and watershed protection program. I'll kind of work through what the program is itself, our action plan, a bit about our committee, and then go into some key learnings. And I'll pass it over to the other panelists to add some color commentary at that point as well. So my name is Julie Pisani. I have been working with the RDN since 2011, uh, coordinating the Drinking Water and Watershed Protection Program. And to introduce the program, I'll start with a little bit of the origin story. So the drivers that really ignited this program within the RDN uh, really started with the recognition that water is not confined by political boundaries. And really, it is important to manage water on that regional watershed scale. Um, and the DWWP program was founded in order to really coordinate this effort across jurisdictions. So if we take a look at our region here, uh, this resides within the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, uh, specifically Staminas, uh, Stanemo, Sanawas, uh, Qualcomm, as well as Comox uh, First Nations. And as you can see on the map here, we've got a bunch of different lines that are indicating jurisdictional boundaries. So I'll draw your attention to first the blue lines there. So not the rivers, but the blue lines being the uh, municipal and electoral area boundaries. So within our region, we do have four municipalities, City of Nanaimo, District of Lanceville, City of Parksville, Town of Qualcomm Beach, and then seven electoral areas as indicated by the letters there. Now the orange boundaries are overlain, which is kind of the framework we operate with, with our drinking water and watershed protection program. It's kind of stepping away from simply looking at jurisdictional boundaries and political boundaries, but looking at those watershed boundaries and what we call water regions. So those are the seven water regions that we use as a planning framework for a lot of our programs within the region. Now, speaking about source water, so each of the municipalities within our region uh, manage and operate their own source water systems. And we'll hear a little bit more about that, especially from the city of Nanaimo later on. Uh, but a key point here is that surface water, yes, is important, especially for a city of Nanaimo who get their drinking water from uh, the Nanaimo River watershed, um, which is actually outside the water region in which their land base resides. So they're in water region five, but the drinking water supply comes from the south fork of the Nanaimo River. And then as you look across the rest of the region, uh, groundwater starts to factor in as a really important source water. So District of Lanceville operate their own groundwater well system, as well as have a servicing agreement with the city of Nanaimo for some expansion within that municipality. City of Parksville, also groundwater system, as well as a surface water system from the Englishman River watershed, that's joint with the Nanus Bay Peninsula that the RDN operates. Town of Qualcomm Beach, also groundwater as their primary drinking water supply. And then outside the municipalities, across the electoral areas, there's groundwater as the key uh, drinking water source for rural residents on private wells or getting water from small water systems. Now, if we think about all these different jurisdictions at play, 
Um, you know, this infographic here just scratches the surface of some of the different jurisdictions that overlap with water. In the regional district of Nanaimo, for example, drainage and roads within the electoral areas, MOTI, so Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, is a really important authority for looking at rural road drainage. Uh, but then in municipalities, that's run by municipalities themselves. So there's this overlapping jurisdiction in terms of drainage and roads, in terms of, we can skip to, you know, agriculture, of course, that's, uh, you know, the provincial regulations around agriculture, there's the Agricultural Land Commission, Land Reserve, uh, you look at water allocation and licensing, that's provincial, and then land use planning and regulation will fall to local governments, and the number of other, you know, cross-jurisdictional considerations. So it's really navigating these partnerships uh, that was the genesis of creating the Drinking Water and Watershed Protection Program. So a little bit on the timeline here, I'll get you to start by looking at the right hand side um, and I'll kind of run through a bit of the, the step by step. So back in the early 2000s, the RDN board identified drinking water and watershed protection really as a priority in their strategic plan. And so that set into motion the first sort of committee that was focused on these issues, uh, the Drinking Water Watershed Protection Stewardship Committee that developed the initial action plan for the program. So when that action plan was developed uh, at the end of 2007, uh, the question was, how are we going to then implement this ambitious action plan? And really, it came down to defining a funding source to make sure this was a long term prospect to implement the action plan. So it went to referendum in 2008 to establish a service uh, through a parcel tax funding mechanism to fund the implementation of the plan. And that was a successful referendum that did establish the service within the electoral areas and program implementation commenced in 2009. And then by 2012, the four member municipalities were also all partners within the DWWP function through servicing agreement. And then skip to 2019, lots of work in between, but 2019, we did update our action plan for the second decade of the service. Now on the left side here, it kind of runs through the funding model. So we were authorized up to uh, $25 parcel tax initially with the referendum, but only $10 was initially um, requisitioned. And then by the time the municipal partners had come into the fold, it was $8 across all parcels. And then with our new action plan that has been increased to $12 to fund additional scope in the action plan with two more increments of increase uh, proposed for 2022 and 2023 to bring that up to a $16 requisition. So now really briefly on the action plan itself. So what is the substance of our action plan? What is our vision? What is our mission? And really it's, uh, it orients around to the regional leadership role uh, to support a few different elements. So in the infographic here, um, we have this thread weaving through like a river, which is collaboration. And that's tying together the three main pillars of our program, which is water awareness and stewardship. So that foundational, public understanding and engagement in water and watershed issues. Uh, the water and information and science, which is again, a really important piece for actual knowledge-based, science-based decision-making um, and collecting data local to our region to support that. And then funneling that information into water-centric planning and policy support, not only at the local government level, but that information being available to provincial governments, First Nations, community, industry, and so forth. So a little window into some of our actions, um, you know, goes into great depth with a laundry list of all the things that we do. Um, but essentially, if I was to highlight some of the key initiatives, um, we are very engaged in community-based outreach. We have extensive rebate programs, encouraging and incentivizing sustainable practices. Uh, we coordinate with the water service providers within the region for uh, streamlined messaging around things like uh, watering restrictions and drought messaging. Uh, we convene and participate in advisory committees. Um, we also run monitoring networks across the region to collect regional water data, surface water, groundwater, climate. Um, and we also are in the business of not only just collecting the data, but analyzing, interpreting that data with assistance from consulting professionals uh, to really get to that um, meaning and understanding and then communicating that to the public and decision makers and really advancing and facilitating the integration of all that information into planning processes. 
So to introduce our technical advisory committee, this is really an important uh, nexus for collaboration. I've listed all the different groups that are engaged with our committee, um, which is a, a really important way to kind of cross pollinate across all the different jurisdictions that have a stake within water and watershed management in the region. And just briefly, you know, these are sort of the key um, actions or ro the role of the committee itself. So providing recommendations to the RDN board regarding activities related to the program, and then participating on smaller working groups and ad hoc committees on specific issues and tasks, really providing that advice and feedback on our technical reports uh, and identifying tools and techniques to really maintain an adaptive management approach to our service where we're monitoring our progress, evaluating what's working and what isn't, and adapting as we go, um, and increasing the effectiveness through those partnerships. Now to get into some key learnings before I hand it off to my panel members, if I was to summarize a few things here, really when we're talking about transcending jurisdiction, organizations really must embrace this sort of multiplicity of roles and partners, understandings and processes and start aligning our decisions and our activities with those natural system boundaries. So that's, you know, the role of saying, hey, it's, it's the RDN's role to do land use planning, but it also is an important role for us to interface with the stewardship sector and to mobilize citizens in collecting data that can support that decision making. You know, it's also our role to partner with provincial government in things like educating on the groundwater licensing or uh, wellhead protection regulations. You know, we partner with First Nations to sort of expand beyond just the lens of, of data to traditional knowledge and storytelling and convening on the riverbanks and, and exchanging in that way. Um, and consulting professionals that help run through technical analysis with us. So it's this multiplicity of roles as an organization, but also recognizing our partners can play a multiplicity of roles with us. And then capacity, I would, I would zero in on, you know, to transcend these jurisdictional limitations or limits, uh, building capacity within each organization and community is really critical. And this requires investment. So this has really been um, something where the long-term investment in the program has built not only RDN's capacity, but you know, the community's capacity to participate. You know, it's built capacity across the water, water managers in the various municipalities and small water systems. Um, you know, the partnerships with forestry managers, with schools, the list goes on. And I'll also lastly point to forums. So having those round tables, those committees, those working groups that allows us to discuss, discuss the key issues share information, brainstorm, and maybe outside of the decision-making table to kind of have those creative uh, interface to then bring the you know, advice through to the boards and the decision-making bodies. And that really has helped to maintain connection between groups, momentum on our projects, and accountability across the different groups as well. So those are some highlights, and I'm gonna now pass over to my colleague, Mike Squire, from the city of Nanaimo uh, to run through a few slides for us as well from his perspective. Thanks, Julie. Um, Mike Squire, I'm the manager of water resources for the city of Nanaimo. So unlike um, many regional districts like Metro Vancouver and the Capital Regional District in Victoria, we don't own our watershed. Instead, we partner with uh, forest, uh, Mosaic Forest Management who actually own the watershed on land needs and have and have restricted access area that is uh, co-monitored with Mosaic security. And our staff members also monitor it on a daily basis, as well as Mosaic is out there actively in, in that area, ensuring that, you know, there is no, the public's not out there creating a menace, uh, you know, there's been acts of vandalism in the area, but, you know, with having that, uh, restricted access, it it's definitely helps us co-manage that area. Um, if you can advance the slide too, Julie, please. And we're working with the, the community on the educational component. Most of our flow from the dam is actually for environmental flow releases for fisheries purposes. So we're working with the province on that. We're working with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the RDN is a, a huge benefit to us on the education component of that. Uh, a lot of people, they don't think when they turn on the tap. So there's, there's a huge resource out there. And we feel that our watershed and our dams and our watershed are our biggest mitigation to climate change. 
So if I can get you to go to the next slide. Perfect. And again, unlike many municipalities or regional districts, we're actually the city that supplies neighboring municipalities with water. Um, and in doing so, it's with public presentations and anything changes in our, our water where we regularly need to meet with the public and convey what we're doing with the watershed, it's nice to have the drinking water watershed protection program to point to as like a central repository for all watership, all watership needs. It's, it's hugely beneficial for that from that proponent. I've also worked with a neighboring municipality that Julie mentioned, the city of Parksville uh, for over 14 years and very much very similar uh, infrastructure that you're looking at. Um, same land owner with mosaic forest management and also conveying to a neighboring municipality or the regional district in that case. So again, um, looking at the drinking water watershed protection program, being involved in it for over 10 years has been um, hugely beneficial for us. Um, having that, like I said before, it's, it's like a central repository. And also it's a collaboration and meeting with the, um, you know, the other stakeholders in that area, such as local First Nations, the province and DFO. So that's all I have. Excellent. Thanks very much, Mike. We'll advance the slides to the next panelist who's uh, joining us, which is Jessica Doyle uh, from the Ministry of Forest Land Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. She's the Water Protection Section Head, another member of our Technical Advisory Committee. So I'll pass it over to you, Jess. Thanks, Julie. <clears throat> So Julie just introduced me, but I'll just quickly introduce myself again. Um, so I am Jessica Doyle, and I'm the Water Protection Section Head for the West Coast region of the Ministry of Flinro. Um, so I'm a member of the Technical Advisory Committee. Um, so I represent Flinro on the committee, but I also am a prof uh, professional hydrogeologist, so I kind of have that lens as well. Um, so I'm just going to kind of talk about water protection's role in the drinking water and Watershed Protection Technical Advisory Committee's um, program. So um, we do quite a bit of collaborative monitoring with the RDN. Um, so we do surface water monitoring and a few years ago, an MOU was signed between RDN, Flinro and uh, DFO. And so the Technical Advisory Committee helped to select uh, key locations where streamflow monitoring would be helpful to kind of fill in data gaps. And so our specialists worked with the TAC and Julie and, and DFO to kind of install and, and do the surface water monitoring stations, which are in three streams in the RDN. Um, we've also worked with the RDN uh, to do some provincial groundwater observation well network expansion. And so an example of this is a partnership that took place between RDN, Flinro and and our CAN and the Geological Survey of Canada through an Anaimo Lowlands mapping initiative and modeling initiative that took place. And um, through some uh, external funding was able to drill um, a number of wells in the area that we brought into the provincial groundwater observation well network. Um, Julia can, Julie kind of mentioned it, but RDN has a volunteer monitoring well network, which helps to kind of augment the PGOWN network in terms of providing additional monitoring data to understand the groundwater resource. Um, but we, our groundwater technician helps provide technical support and kind of standards and protocols for the data. So if um, the well owners are uh, okay to have the water be published on the provincial networks, um, we help to get that published into Aquarius. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, so we also have a number of projects which we help to you know, work with um, projects and initiatives happening with the RDN to kind of build off each other. So just some recent examples of these is uh, the RDN did an area E phase three water budget and we were able to acquire some funds to be able to update um, the aquifer mapping within the study area in order so, um, so that study was kind of feeding off of the, the best and most up-to-date aquifer boundary and general information. Um, another example is we commissioned a, a hydraulic connection and aquifer mapping project in the French Creek area. And currently that's going to be fed into a, a, a French Creek water region phase three water bud budget study. Um, so they're kind of building off of each other and kind of yeah, pooling our resources and ultimately to be able to 
make more informed uh, planning and statutory decisions under the Water Sustainability Act, but also like for local government planning as well. We'll go to the next slide. Um, finally, we do a lot of support um, and kind of collaborative initiatives on outreach and public education. So um, for example, we always present uh, groundwater protection and um, general uh, kind of government initiatives at the WellSmart um, program that our webinar series or presentation series that the RDN does. I believe one's actually happening today. Um, and then also with um, just even like Water Sustainability Act uh, outreach and groundwater licensing outreach, the RDN has always been a really great vehicle for us to kind of uh, do some education by. Um, yeah, overall, um, we're very grateful to be a part of the TAC and I'm always blown away by the amount of work um, and then just the scale of, of initiatives and projects that the RDN is able to do through this program. So it's pretty awesome. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Jessica. And we'll pass off to our, our third and final panelist, uh, Pam Jorgensen with Mosaic Forest Management, who's a land use forester. So Pam, take it away. Thanks, Julie. Um, pleased to be here today as a number, another member of our, uh, of the RDN's Drinking Water uh, Technical Advisory Committee. So Mosaic sits on the committee as a forestry rep. And um, I think given our role in the various uh, community watersheds out there, it's, it's very important for us to be present. So Mosaic, just to start, is um, the Timberlands manager for two companies, Island Timberlands and Timber West. And um, in the Nanaimo area, predominantly the lands we've got there are privately um, owned forest lands. So um, if you slide, switch the slides, um, Julie, thank you. This, this kind of captures one of the reasons it's so important. So the, the, hat, the screen that goes out into the ocean is the RDN boundary. And then the other kind of lighter blue screen that's a little bit more transparent is actually the private land holdings that we look after as mosaic. So when you overlay the various community watersheds onto that private forest land, um, onto that working forest, you can see the importance of us um, being at the table and participating in an active way in the uh, drinking water systems. So highlighted again, just like two of our other uh, within our group, the Jump Lake Reservoir, and that's kind of what I'm gonna focus on for the talk today. And that is what it looks like. Oh, it's uh, quite a beautiful spot if you have the chance to go there and just calling people's attention, you can see the history of forest management in the background there on those slopes. And um, so we are actively managing for forests, but you know, with the importance of the drinking water in mind at all times. Next slide, thanks. So in our role within um, these collaborations with these groups we're on with today, a big thing we do is education. It's really exciting to be part of tours, the school tours we're normally doing, I think about eight a year that are coordinated through the RDN, but the city of Nanaimo and Mosaic also participate. And uh, we get these students out into the watershed so they can actually see the source of their water and experience, it almost feels like an experience of traveling from the dam all the way down to um, the tap. And uh, so the RDN coordinates it and we participate. And so does the city of Nanaimo. We talk about how um, the collaboration between forestry and the water purveyor is so important. And then we also usually get to go to the um, treatment plant with the city of Nanaimo and actually see what happens at that step of the, of the tour. Uh, community tours as well, they look similar, except these are open to the public. And I think generally those are coordinated by the city. Um, and we get to go see the jump dam, we get to see the South Forks dam, and usually lots of questions from people who want to know, you know, how we collaborate, where does their water come from, what does it all look like, and uh, it's a great, it's a great collaboration for all of us. We've done some videos lately, um, the top one was one that Mosaic did, and I added a link there, um, a web link, if you do want to go look at it later, but all three of us within the partnership, um, the city and the RDN and Mosaic, uh, collaborated on that video. And the RDN also did some additional videos to kind of supplement the school tours during COVID. So we've been actively um, involved in those as well. And it's it's all been a great experience. So when we think more specifically about operations, there's a lot of collaboration as well um, within the uh, 
within the jump area. And it is necessary for us in the city of Nanaimo to really get together um, when it comes to access security, as Mike talked about. So it is private land, Mosaic manages it. Um, we look after gates, so we're able to, you know, support the restrictions for public access into these drinking water areas um, with our gates and with our security systems. We do the road maintenance. It, it's an active working forest as well, so that's a real support to those needing to get access to the dams um, for the drinking water um, purpose. And another thing that I just like to point out is, you know, we all know um, how important it is to prevent forest fires in drinking water areas. And so one of the unique things I think about Mosaic being um, responsible for this big private forest asset is that we invest a lot of money into fire prevention. So at times when maybe a lot of our resources on the coast are getting sucked away into the interior for forest firefighting, um, it does sometimes leave coastal forest managers a little bit at a loss if something were to go sideways. So what we do is we, um, over the past couple of years, we've actually had a helicopter on standby during the extreme fire season, just ready in case something goes wrong. So that's something we do as a private land owner um, because the, the resource is just so critical to our success. And I think that's a co-benefit to the city. Um, so two more slides here, and I'll just breeze through this one really quickly, but you know, we spend a lot of time on uh, technology and science and making sure we've got good data. We're monitoring what's going on in these watersheds, especially in the drinking watersheds. And um, the study that's highlighted on the bottom left, you can't see it super closely, but that was basically, um, we, we've done these big studies in the jump area and been able to compare this, this circumstances on the land over 20 years. So we have the same um, engineer come in and do an analysis 20 years apart and able to show that the conditions in the, um, in the area just continue to improve. So sediment sources, hydrologic change, stream channels, riparian condition, all of those things improving. Um, and we've been able to show that with, um, you know, through, through this third party scientist. Uh, and, and the other point here is that we have this great network of weather stations that we've got out on the land. We've actually got 38 um, satellite linked weather stations and six snow pillows and uh, a whole bunch of other agreements with governments and academia where we're hosting weather, weather stations a lot of them provide real-time data so that we know what the conditions are in these watersheds and we're able to, you know, monitor and um, adjust and, you know, do the important things as we go. One more slide. And this is, again, a reference. I think I've seen it now twice within our little group here, but just another way that um, Mosaic does support the RDN work through this community watershed monitoring network. So we're, we'll, we'll be involved to help with access provide a little bit of funding to help with the um, analysis of the, of the samples that are taken, but really working with the various agencies that are at the table here to get the public out and involved in community watershed monitoring. And um, it's another part of the program that we're pleased to be um, supporting. Excellent. Thanks so much for the overview, Pam. And I think that uh, that does it for our panel. And uh, we'll turn it back over to, I guess it's Trisha who will be speaking on the next panel. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Julie and Pam and Mike and Jessica. I found that very interesting. And I think it was really neat to hear the different perspectives from a municipality, a regional government, a provincial government and industry all working together. And thanks a lot for sharing that. I wanted to want to invite Trisha Brett now to share her screen and lead her panel through. The next part here. Great. Just a moment here to share. We'll start the presentation. There. Uh, hi, my name is Trisha Brett. I work with the Regional District of North Okanagan. Um, I've been here in my current role since 2019, but I also worked with the Regional District uh, for Greater Vernon Water. Uh, from 2004 to 2009, which is when this project started. So I still have some perspective from back then. Um, I really appreciate uh, the Nymo's pre presentation. Um, it's very different than ours. And, and so I, I find that uh, this is great. You know, great, good job, Kelly, for, for organizing the different groups. Uh, 
what I wanted to convey through the presentation was, um, you know, again, also the name of, of this webinar, the shared challenges, shared challenges that, that we've all, that we all experience on the landscape, uh, shared opportunities through uh, collaboration on research, um, climate monitoring, uh, water, water quality monitoring, um, water quantity monitoring, and then how we transcend those jurisdictions has already been identified. There's, um, you know, multiple silos on, on a landscape and um, how do we transcend that? And we've really found yeah, for us that having a technical advisory committee has been critical. Uh, the technical advisory group, uh, as kind of shown here, has been around for 12 years and going strong, with the exception of a little bit of a COVID break um, last year and, and maybe my transition into the role. Uh, that brings up, um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, Rini Clark and, and all her work and shepherding this project along. So um, Greater Vernon Water has two main sources. We also have um, some groundwater sources and we have potable and non-potable, but there are two main sources. One is the Dudo Creek supply, which I'll be talking about today. And then we have Kalamalka Lake. Um, Kalamalka Lake has some of the jurisdictional challenges that um, RDNO, or sorry, RDN has already identified, but um, Dudo Creek is very different. Um, so Greater Vernon Water as, as a whole has, is um, the third largest water utility in British Columbia. And um, we serve approximately 58,000 people uh, within the city of Vernon boundaries, district of Coldstream, uh, part of electoral areas B, C, D, and we also supply some to Spallum Sheen. Uh, Dudo Creek out of those supplies that I identified is the major supply for uh, the potable and non-potable supply. Um, so why we had to start with some source protection planning and assessment. Um, RDNO has always recognized that um, source protection is critical in the multi-barrier approach to providing clean, safe drinking water. Uh, but it is also um, identified in our conditions on permit through the Drinking Water Protection Act. So in 2008, the assessment and protection plan was completed, and it was the first of its kind within Interior Health Region and within the Okanagan Basin. First of all, funding was important. Um, that was identified to the Regional District Board that we needed funding as a capital investment uh, for source assessment and the uh, planning. Um, continued funding has, has been a, a different challenge, but um, the, the bulk of the funding was supplied up at front. And then it was identified that uh, we didn't know what we didn't know. So first gathering uh, all the watershed partners uh, together to, to see how that process was going to continue, uh, then hiring a consultant and um, moving forward with the assessment protection plan and uh, recommendations and, and what to do and rank those recommendations was very important. Um, the Part of the important part is identifying anthropogenic impacts to water quality and then of course climate change. Uh, the Dudo Creek watershed as identified here is primarily in crown land. We have a little tiny bit of private land that the regional district of North Okanagan owns, but um, mainly it's all crown land. So very different than the last example we have. Um, that means that, as Kelly identified at the beginning, um, water purveyors have little to no authority, but under the Drinking Water Protection Act, must supply clean, safe drinking water and through our conditions on permit, a source protection plan for all of our sources. Uh, because there's um, multiple jurisdictions, multiple pieces of legislation, and in a lot of different silos, uh, there's sometimes a lack of clarity on how to move forward with that, or I would say always a lack of clarity. At the time, um, 2008 and proceeding, there were, uh, we were facing issues of um, the funding pullback from uh, provincial campsites, increased logging due to mountain pine beetle, um, removal of natural rain barriers partially due to the mountain pine beetle logging. So um, where there was forest, there was now free access to cattle um, and increased recreation impact from fencing. So on fencing, sorry. So, uh, because we have a multi-use watershed, which includes um, range, uh, recreation for hunting, um, ATVing, uh, et cetera, and um, logging, and then some mining, 
we have uh, fencing in place. And at the time there was, people were cutting fences to gain access or leaving gates open that were either normally closed or normally open either way. Uh, so really um, it became very clear through the initial setup of the attack that there was a need for uh, shared information um, and working together. So as I mentioned, the TAC was uh, set up early in the process, but it was the, the formation and the continuation of the advisory committee that's really been important for um, long-term water, water quality protection and watershed protection. Um, following the completion of the source assessment, a field tour with the watershed partners or the TAC members and politicians helped to show and really um, put a point on what needed to be done and, and action on the ground that was needed. After that, there was a facilitated technical advisory group meeting um, that was held to establish some shared goals and what the RDNO's involvement was at that table and what and, and um, share ideas on how um, the goals could be moving forward. Um, it also was starting the framework for the terms of reference for the group. So goals identified that um, to protect water quantity and quality of the Dudo, of Dudo Creek with the understanding that Dudo Creek is a multi-use community watershed. So that was a very important part to um, the technical advisory committee. There, it, it isn't owned um, by RDNO. It isn't operated by anyone in particular. There are multiple stakeholders and it was very important for the group at the table to really um, bring that forward. Um, the meetings that were to be held were meant to be collaborative planning. So not finger pointing, not meant to um, resolve a conflict, um, but really that there would be uh, sharing at the table uh, and real on the ground, um, real on the ground uh, action items and that the recommendations from the assessment and plan could be moved forward. Also within the terms of reference, it was uh, identified that there would be a winter meeting and then a field tour meeting in September, October, which that winter meeting meant to establish what was gonna happen uh, for the upcoming year in terms of action items to forward the recommendations set out in the plan. Um, and then the field tour to really uh, get out and see what had been accomplished. Um, so just the, the membership of the TAC included, and still includes now, Interior Health, um, Flynn Road Representation, which from uh, Recreation, Range Program, Forest Tenures, Engineering and Roads, Ecosystems, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, Indigenous Groups, Range Users, such as Coldstream Ranch and Gary Andrews, uh, and Forest Licensees, such as Tolco and uh, BC Timber Sales. So um, I think that the part that I'd like to highlight about the technical advisory committee here is that it was really um, starting from a small point and, and you can do a lot with, with a little and, and just interaction and really um, starting out with the plan each year and, and moving forward with that plan. Um, to me, the, the formation and the continuation of our advisory committee has been very grassroots. While we've accomplished a lot um, in terms of, of research goals um, with, with uh, cattle monitoring, bacterial source tracking, um, changes within range barriers, um, some of the things that, that my panel, the other panelists will be talking about, um, it, it really has felt very grassroots. I think the first meeting that I attended uh, that I remember was um, the identified, Arduino identified a cattle guard that was plugged solid and, and not effective from our perspective. And, and what, what was gonna happen? How, how would we, you know, we, we talked about this with, with the ranchers and, and a little bit with the province, but what's gonna be done? And then, you know, um, the Coldstream Ranch put up their hand saying, you know, actually that, that cattle guard's ineffective where it is because of X, Y, Z. And then, um, you know, why, why is it ineffective? Well, where should it be? Well, you know, on a map, it, it should be moved down. Okay, well, how are we gonna do that? And then Tolko putting their hand up saying, yeah, actually we've got some equipment in the area. So what we're gonna do is pull that, if you show us where, we'll pull the cattle guard and we'll put it 
in, in the new location. So it's really that 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 has 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 started and, and kind of ballooned into something that, that's much more um, um, maybe solid now, but it, it's really, I think the effectiveness of it has been those grassroots type meetings. Um, there's been, you know, long-term relationship building. I think prior to the advisory committee, you know, there was no faces to names, um, you know, shared contact lists were difficult. Um, so it's really been helpful for uh, maintaining connections through these phone calls, meetings, you know, now Zoom meetings, um, and really ensuring everyone remains engaged and connected. Something that's really been invaluable, especially in light of um, changes to legislation and changes to operating practices um, is really the knowledge sharing. Um, there's really outside of um, these meetings, it's hard for someone in uh, the water industry to interact with uh, someone in the forestry industry um, and same for in cattle ranching and someone in cattle ranching to interact with the forestry industry. So it, the advisory committee provide an opportunity for um, knowledge sharing, um, perspective sharing, uh, and really a forum for discussion rather than each of us being in our silos or, or in our own echo chambers. And through that, there is a uh, group approach to funding and combined research initiatives. So um, for example, uh, this year, we're um, starting a project with the University of British Columbia Okanagan on um, cumulative effects in the watershed from um, roads, forestry, uh, recreation, et cetera, on water quantity and water quality. And by talking about it at some of our advisory committees, there's an opportunity for TOLCO to say, well, hey, you know, we're actually conducting um, some of our hydrology monitoring in the area. So we'll share that information and make sure that, that the end result is much more robust. Uh, some of the recent learnings, which, which seem silly, but are good to acknowledge, um, are recognizing, you know, time's important for everybody. So we used to have these two meetings um, all in person, but, you know, geographic locations have changed. People are moving. There's more remote offices. So having our Zoom meetings in the winter have become important and, and will continue but still meeting and acknowledging that face-to-face -face is, is very important and on the ground experience is very important. So having those field tours are, are really um, important to keep everyone um, informed of what's going on on the ground and making sure we're all, you know, fingers on the pulse sort of thing. It hasn't all been wins, of course. Uh, there's, there's continuous improvement needed for, to, to carry on and, um, so I wanted to identify here, for example, there's, there's road issues um, that's within legislation. So one of those uh, jurisdiction conflicts and, and, and challenges that we're working with. Um, but this is a site uh, up here that we visited. Um, so there's some sediment impacts upstream and then some road impacts to an undersized culvert, which resulted in a, um, a fence that's down. So uh, preventing cattle access, uh, it's no longer functioning. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so at our site meeting, it's identified, well, whose responsibility is this? How we, how, and it, that's a bit confusing. So how do we actually move forward to fix this? <coughs> We're also working uh, with wildfire mitigation um, on Crown land. That's challenging for funding. Uh, again, we don't have um, private land to work with here. So where, <coughs> where's the funding coming from? <laughs> <laughs> how are we moving forward? And then um, some ineffective rain bar range barriers. So through a research project, it was identified that um, debris fences are a great tool um, and low cost and good for wildlife as well as um, uh, cattle management. But on one of our field tours, this one was demonstrated as, you know, it wasn't functioning. It's something you can, you can see, right? You, there's a, a it's supposed to prevent cows, but there's cow patty on this side. So something we can see and, and we all kind of, uh, you know, laugh about it, but at the same time, well, what's a what's a realistic solution, and how can we get that um, through to the on the forest planning process? Um, and then communication. It's always, always, always something that that needs improvement. But um, you know, we want less uh, we want less trees in certain areas for wildfire uh, protection. But you know, please leave more trees there and. And really, you know, the a conversation that I've had recently with um, the forest licensees is, is, you know, what is the goal? What what's the overall picture? So kind of reeling back and, and saying, okay, yeah, we have some work to do with communication. 
So that's it for me. Um, next, I'll just move the slide forward. Uh, Jamie Skinner will be. And I'm just going to jump in for a second. It's 11.50, so we only have 10 minutes left and we still have three <laughs> panelists. So I'm just going to encourage the final three panelists to be concise and also encourage the audience to enter any questions you have in the Q&A box and panelists can um, write responses to those questions as the presentation is happening. So I see Julie's already answered a couple of questions. So I don't think we're going to have time for a designated question period. So please, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A as the presentations are proceeding. If you have to leave directly at noon, feel free to do that. Um, we will probably go a little bit over because I would really like to give the final three panelists the, the appropriate amount of time for their presentations. So go ahead, Jamie. All right, thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Tricia. I just have the one slide to speak to. So uh, I would like to echo a lot of what Tricia said just around communication. Um, we operate on Crown land in, in this community watershed. That's one of the differences between the east coast of Vancouver Island and where we are. And TOCO operates about 90% of the watershed is um, designated as TOCO operating area. So knowing that our footprint in this watershed can have a significant impact uh, from sediment, changes in timing of flows, it, it, it's important certainly for the water purveyor to be in communication, regular communication with us. So this long-term relationship that that has been established and continues to grow does really help facilitate some some hard conversations i know we talk about collaboration but this this photo uh here for example is harvey lake where the intake's located which is below the reservoir system all that are area below um the reservoirs is is in what's known as the the higher vulnerability zone um, because if there's any uh, forestry activities in that area that cause uh, sediment that has a much more direct connection to the Duto Creek main stem which could, could end up in in the uh, intake in in just hours in in some cases so um, having that sharing of information uh, we have the vulnerability mapping uh, we've collected LIDAR, more detailed information. Um, we worked out some sharing of that data. Uh, Tricia mentioned the, the sharing of assessments as we're conducting our, our watershed assessment that's consistent with the new professional practice guidelines for connecting water or conducting watershed assessments. Having those conversations with the purveyor, connecting our hydrologist with UBCO and the work that they're doing uh, will be important. And I think also just the couple scenarios that Trisha threw up there around roads in particular, it's often difficult to understand who might be responsible for that issue. That particular situation is a forest service road, Tolco holds uh, a permit to, to use and maintain that, but we actually can't just simply go ahead and replace that culvert. We need to go through uh, get that approved by Flynn Rowe and appraise that. So this, that communication, all the different moving parts are, I think it's helpful to have a, an under, you know, educate each other what the issues are, but also Trisha can pick up the phone or email me and say, hey, you know, we've got this issue. Uh, many of her folks are out there every single day in the watershed seeing issues. Um, and so it makes it easier to reach out. And, and then within our large woodlands organization, I can go and do a bit of my own research to figure out whether or not that is something we need to deal with or get, get uh, government involved and hopefully come up with a solution. So we know that we're, our activities are, are listed as a threat in, in source protection, uh, harvesting, uh, road building. Um, and so we need to continue to improve our practices so that we maintain, you know, the social license and, and the license to continue to operate in, in the watershed as well. So, yeah, so we appreciate being, being invited and being involved in this and, and look forward to it continuing. Thanks. So I'll just advance the slide uh, for Ian. McClellan with the Ministry of Forest Lands Natural Resource Operations. Sorry, Jamie, I didn't introduce you. And Hello, everybody hear me okay? Okay, uh, thanks very much for inviting me to talk. Um, I am 
the Okanagan District Recreation Officer with Rec, Rec Sites and Trails BC, which is an independent branch within FLNORD. RSTB provides public recreation opportunities by developing, maintaining, and managing a network of recreation sites and recreation trails throughout the province. We deal with authorized recreation. We are not an enforcement agency. In British Columbia, the public has the right to recreate on Crown land. It has been said that this right is our equivalent of America's Second Amendment, and many will fight tooth and nail to protect those rights. My job is to provide public recreational opportunities, and I do so as part of an integrated team within the provincial government, but also with First Nations, local governments, industry, and other stakeholders. When it comes to source water protection, recreation has often been considered the, the ultimate evil, and it is true recreationalists can do a lot of damage in a short period of time. However, here in the Okanagan, our drinking water comes from multiple small lakes, reservoirs, and streams, and unlike Vancouver and Nanaimo, we can't fence the public out of everywhere. RSTBC got involved with the Duto Creek uh, tack because we all have to get along in, in an ever shrinking sandbox. The Okanagan with a population of about 400,000 and, and is growing by about 2% a year. And there's an ever increasing demand for safe water, but everybody who's showing up is showing up with their various toys to play on crown land. So we need to manage and protect our, our fresh water and managing recreation as part of the, the solution. Uh, for instance, reservoirs are needed and these waters are drawn down as required. However, a drawn down reservoir means mud. Uh, a certain sector of the public love mud and driving their trucks and ATVs and side by sides through it. This is an environmental damage and is illegal. However, it still occurs. As mentioned before, my, my job is to provide recreational opportunities, but to do so in a way that we minimize damage to the environment and other values. So we use the four E's, which is called education, and engineering, enforcement, and evaluation. Educate the public regarding how to recreate on Crown land responsibly. Engineer opportunities that are fun, as safe as possible, and designed to protect the environment and other values and enclose in inappropriate or sensitive areas and use the carrot and stick management. Enforce the rules and regulations and then evaluate constantly. One size does not fit all. New toys and new clients. COVID-19 has seen an explosion in recreation. People turn to the great outdoors for release and suppliers cannot build enough side-by-side -side trailers, dirt bikes, ATVs, etc. They cannot keep up with the demand. And many of these new outdoor enthusiasts have, been off, have never been off pavement before and they don't have many uh, outdoor ethics. So back to mud bogging, which has been a concern, as you can see in that left slide. It is a problem throughout BC, and we don't have the enforcement capacity to completely stop it, so we have to try to manage it. At Grizzly Lake in the Dudo Creek Community Watershed, we had an ever-increasing problem of unmanaged recreation. Mud bogging was on the rise, and so was camping, and there was no bathroom facilities. Um, RS RSTBC worked and continues to work with the Regional District of the North Okanagan and other stakeholders, and we developed the Grizzly Lake Recreation Site, um, which includes a couple of dozen uh, camping spots with fully vaulted uh, pit toilets. It's right beside um, the biggest reservoir in the area, and it also contains a fully uh, self-contained motorized skills area, which has a mud bogging area in it. Um, We've worked with the range branch to close off sensitive sites around the area. And we've also jointly hired a, a site host with the regional district to uh, in the summer months to oversee the area and provide education to the public. The end result is that there is less vandalism on the RDNO dam infrastructure and mud bogging in the adjacent reservoirs has basically been eradicated. Uh, people are having a lot of fun and we have helped to protect the water values. Um, it's basically been a win-win situation for us, and that's about all I have. Thanks. All right. Uh, that's a slide for Rob. Rob Dinwiddie with the Range Program at Simrad. Great. Thanks, Tricia, and uh, thanks, Ian and Jamie. Uh, I've been a range officer for about 12 years in the Okanagan Shoe Shop and worked as in the range program for about 30 years now. Uh, just to give people an oversight that aren't from British Columbia, there's about, uh, if you lived in British Columbia, 95% is crown land, about five, 6% is private land. And uh, within the central uh, south uh, British Columbia, cattle ranching is a significant industry. Uh, within 
We've got 49 watersheds within our district that spans from the American border up to about Revelstoke. And within all 49, we have grazing licenses with livestock. And where those uh, feed into major centers, you can imagine the Okanagan Valley, there's eight uh, community watersheds that feed uh, populations greater than 10,000. I think Tricia pointed out uh, this one feeds 53,000 in the uh, Duto watershed. We've got 400 uh, cow-calf pair and obviously uh, by themselves, uh, they will go where the grass is. They need grass and water and we're protecting water quality is the number one objective. Uh, the TAC committee uh, really forms, a, and I think everybody's uh, nailed it when they've said the communication is a big part. Uh, how can a rancher talk with a forest industry, a water purveyor, uh, other stakeholders, First Nations, uh, how, how can we have our voices uh, input into the planning uh, if we don't have a, uh, a mechanism like a TAC committee? And so the TAC committee for me and for, I think for the ranchers and all of us involved has really formed a excellent framework uh, to identify problems and not just identify problems, but to solve them. The pictures in front of you, if you look on the, uh, the left-hand side, uh, Trisha talked about debris fencing. Debris fencing is an excellent uh, mechanism where uh, difficult to, uh, to maintain areas uh, and yet you want to have livestock control around riparian areas. We found that uh, that the process of bringing that into play with the forest companies, uh, for example, TOCO, um, it, it's widely accepted and it's really an excellent uh, method to put a fence to protect livestock uh, from entering in some of these uh, remote riparian systems that could affect water quality or at least the water quantity on some of these areas. The second picture you see a solar panel. Uh, we're using the technology, a lot of techno uh, technology available uh, that we can move water. And if you move water from uh, a high risk, a high, highly vulnerable area for water quality, uh, it's a, it, it reduces the risk uh, greatly. And so we're using things like uh, uh, nose pumps where cattle actually pump water with their nose, uh, uh, solar panels, uh, things like that. Import, important with respect to, uh, to protecting water quality. Recreation, Ian just talked about the uh, high level of recreational use. The last two slides really talk about uh, the importance. You can't, you can't just uh, expect that recreationalists or cattle are going to uh, uh, obey the law. Cattle in particular don't read signs. And uh, so you have to really be ahead of the game. And, and so we've been working very, very closely in the, ta in the TAC committee with recreation um, to identify areas. We've got a, a huge area just outside of Kelowna uh, where it was in the past 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, it was literally uh, chaotic, uh, difficult area to manage with respect to water quality and activities. Today, uh, it's well managed. Uh, we, we're, we're getting the effect of all uh, our collaborative work. And I think uh, I, I would like to leave with that point is I think the importance, whether it's forestry, recreational, uh, recreation range, First Nations or other stakeholders, it's critical that we have a mechanism to communicate, identify issues and then solve issues uh, it's an ongoing iterative process that uh, uh, will only have success if we work together. So I'll leave it like that, Tricia. If there's any other questions, you can put them in the question box. Thank you. Thanks Thank you all. very much. Great. All right. So last week we ended five minutes early and this week we're five minutes late. So it's all a wash, right? So I just wanted to say thank you so much. I hope to see many of you next week at the webinar session three, where we're going to be talking about collaboration again, but focuses, focus on indigenous led partnerships. And I wanted to say a very special thank you to all of our panelists today. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and share your knowledge and experiences with the group. So with that, see you next week. Bye-bye.